Hi, we have been discussing identical particles in quantum mechanics. We saw the indistinguishability principle for identical particles and we also saw that it follows from the indistinguishability principle that the wave function for a number of identical particles must either be symmetric or antisymmetric. In this class, we shall discuss spins and statistics. Here we are going to see that there is a connection between the spins of the particles and the symmetry of the wave function used to describe them. We have already seen that the symmetry character of a system of identical particles is a constant of motion. This follows from the fact that all two particle exchange operators commute with the Hamiltonian. That is, we had Pij hat commutator with the Hamiltonian is equal to zero. Now, it turns out that a given type of particle is associated with only one type of symmetry. That is, for example, a system of electrons is always described by an antisymmetric wave function, while a system of pions is invariably described by a symmetric wave function. That is, to make the predictions of quantum mechanics match with experimental outcomes, you have to always describe a system of electrons by an antisymmetric wave function. And similarly, a system of pions must always be described by a symmetric wave function so that the predictions uh, of quantum mechanics match with experimental results. So we see that the symmetry character of the wave function is an intrinsic property of the particles. Now in statistical mechanics, you have learned that the statistical properties of a system of a large number of particles actually depend on the available degrees of freedom for each value of the total energy of the system. Or in other words, the statistical properties depend on the number of microstates corresponding to a given energy. For a system of distinguishable particles, every permutation of the particles gives rise to a different state. Because if the particles are distinguishable, interchanging two particles gives us a different configuration. So it has to be counted as a different microstate. And this way of counting microstates leads to the classical of Boltzmann statistics. So for particles obeying Boltzmann statistics, the interchange of any two particles leads to a different configuration or a different microstate. In statistical mechanics, you might have learned that this type of counting actually leads to certain problems like the Gibbs paradox if the particles are identical. And the reason for the paradox was that this way of counting the microstate gives an overestimate for the number of microstates in the case of identical particles. The statistics obeyed by a system of identical particles with symmetric wave functions is known as the Bose-Einstein statistics, whereas identical particles with antisymmetric wave functions obey Fermi-Dirac statistics. Now we already saw that the symmetry character of the wave function is an intrinsic property of the particles. So it follows that the statistics associated with the particle or with the collection of a given type of particle is also of an intrinsic nature. That is, the statistics obeyed by a collection of identical particles is a characteristic of the type of particles under consideration. So we may classify particles on the basis of the statistics obeyed by them. Particles obeying Bose-Einstein statistics are called bosons while those obeying Fermi-Dirac statistics are referred to as fermions. Further, it's found that the statistics obeyed by a type of particles is intimately connected with the spin of the particles. So bosons have integral spin, including zero, and fermions have, uh, have half integral spins. And this correlation between spin and statistics actually applies to elementary particles as well as to composite particles. For example, we can talk about atoms and nuclei. These are composite particles and the statistics obeyed by them is also intimately connected with their spin. It's not difficult to understand this because a composite particle, which is composed of fermions, for example, it can have integral or half integral spin according to whether the number of fermions is even or odd. If the number of fermions in the composite particle is even, then the composite part particle will have an integral spin. And in this case, an interchange between two such composite particles 
is equivalent to an even number of interchanges of fermions okay? so that the wave function should be symmetric. So every interchange of two such composite particles amounts to an even number of interchanges of fermions. And we know that for fermions, a single interchange causes the wave function to pick up a minus sign. But if the number of interchanges is even, then the wave function remains the same. Or in other words, the wave function is symmetric. In the same way, in the case of composite particles involving an odd number of fermions or an odd number of half integral spin particles, the wave function has to be antisymmetric. We have already seen that the wave function of a system of spin half particles has to be antisymmetric. Let's consider a system of two spin half particles. And if phi alpha 1 and phi alpha 2 denote the two quantum states available to the particle, then we can write psi of 1 comma 2 is equal to phi alpha 1 of 1 multiplying phi alpha 2 of 2. This corresponds to a state where the first particle is in the state phi alpha 1 and the second particle in the state phi alpha 2. But we know that this cannot be a wave function representing our two particle system because our wave function representing the two particle spin half system has to be an antisymmetric wave function. And the antisymmetric combination can be written as psi a of 1 comma 2 is equal to 1 divided by square root of 2 factorial 1 minus p12 hat phi alpha 1 of 1 multiplying phi alpha 2 of 2. This can also be written as this, this can also be written in this form, okay? Because the identity operator acting on this just gives phi alpha 1 of 1, phi alpha 2 of 2. Whereas the particle exchange operator P12 acting on this gives phi alpha 1 of 2 multiplying phi alpha 2 of 1. Because what this particle exchange operator does is to exchange these labels, the labels 1 and 2. So this would be the correct wave function representing a system of two identical particles with spin half. Now there is something interesting about this wave function because if alpha 1 and alpha 2 are same or if phi alpha 1 and phi alpha 2 are the same state, then this wave function is just zero, which means that there is no quantum mechanical state corresponding both spin half particles in the same state because as we said, if particle 1 and particle 2 are in the same state, then this wave function is just zero. So in the case of electrons, no two electrons can be in exactly the same state. And you might already be familiar with this statement. This is the Pauli exclusion principle. This antisymmetric wave function can also be written using determinants. We can write psi a of 1 comma 2 is equal to 1 divided by square root of 2 factorial determinant of phi alpha 1 of 1, phi alpha 1 of 2, phi alpha 2 of 1, phi alpha 2 of 2. Because expanding this determinant gives exactly 1 divided by square root of 2, okay, phi alpha 1 of 1, phi alpha 2 of 2 minus phi alpha 1 of 2, phi alpha 2 of 1. Okay. This is exactly the antisymmetric wave function that we wrote down in the previous slide. So the antisymmetric wave function can also be constructed using determinants like this. Note that all entries in the first row have the, sub, have the same subscript alpha 1. All right. Similarly, all entries in the second row have the same subscript alpha 2. This way of constructing an antisymmetric wave function can be generalized from the two particle case to the n particle case. In the case of n identical fermions, the wave function, the antisymmetric wave function that we are going to construct has to be a linear combination of the n factorial functions that correspond to the n factorial permutations of the particles. Okay, Because if there are n particles, there are n factorial permutations of them. If there are two particles, there are just two permutations of them. And Corresponding to each of this permutation, we will have a function. So we will have n factorial functions. Okay. For example, we could have a function like this, phi, phi alpha 1 of 1, phi alpha 2 of 3, phi alpha 3 of 4, phi alpha 4 of 2, like that. All right. Like this, there will be n factorial functions. So just as we construct 
the two particle anti-symmetric wave function from this permutation so from these functions the n factorial sorry the n particle anti-symmetric wave function has to be a superposition a linear superposition of all functions of this type we can write it like this psi a of 1 comma 2 up to n is equal to 1 divided by square root of n factorial which is the normalization factor and sum over all permutations all right so the sum over p is the sum over all permutations and p hat here is the operator corresponding to one such permutation so here we are constructing a linear combination of all permutations of this type okay because we are summing over all permutation operators now here we also have a sign because it's an anti-symmetric wave function there are going to be minus signs in between this is equal to minus 1 raised to pi of p and what is pi of p pi of p is the number of two particle exchange operators contained in this permutation operator so this permutation operator gives us one possible permutation of this combination but this permutation can be reached by a number of two particle exchanges all right any any ex, any permutation or any combination can be reached by a number of two particle permutations so if this permutation of or if this combination can be reached by an odd number of uh, two particle exchanges then the sign here has to will be a minus one okay? and if this combination or a particular permutation is reached by an even number of two particle exchanges all right then the sign here is going to be plus so the anti-symmetric wave function for an n particle system is 1 divided by square root of n factorial where n factorial is the number of permutations and the sum over all permutations of the type p hat acting on phi alpha 1 of 1 phi alpha 2 of 2 etc up to phi alpha n of n okay. and each term has a sign associated with them and this sign is determined by the number of two particle exchanges involved in this particular permutation so here p hat acting on this thing is a different permutation of whatever we started with and if this permutation can be reached by an odd number of two particle exchanges then the sign here is going to be negative okay i hope this is clear it's easier to write this in the form of a determinant we just deter we just generalize the two particle the the two particle case all right over there we had written the determinant as phi alpha 1 of 1 phi alpha 1 of 2 phi alpha 2 of 1 phi alpha 2 of 2 this was the determinant that we wrote down for the two particle case we just generalized this to the case of n particles the normalization factor has to be there which is 1 divided by square root of n factorial okay and in the first row all the subscripts are same so we have got phi alpha 1 of 1 phi alpha 1 of 2 up to phi alpha 1 of n in the second row also all terms have the same subscript alpha 2 so this uh, the terms in the second row are phi alpha 2 of 1 phi alpha 2 of 2 phi alpha 2 of n etc and this determinant form has a name it's called the slater determinant right it's called the slater determinant the pauli exclusion principle also follows from this because if any of these states are equal for example if phi alpha 1 is equal to phi alpha 2 that would mean that these two rows are the same and we know that the determinant vanishes when any two rows are identical so this wave function is non-zero only if alpha 1 alpha 2 up to alpha n are all different if any two rows are the same the wave function is zero which again means that there is no quantum mechanical state with two different particles in exactly the same state which is exactly the Pauli exclusion principle now for a system of bosons the wave function the symmetric wave function of the n particle system is given by 1 divided by square root of n factorial delta which is now the normalization factor and this delta itself depends on the number of particles occupying the same state and here again we have the sum of n factorial permutations so this is a linear superposition of n factorial functions 
each corresponding to a different permutation of the n particles. Clearly, this wave function does not vanish when any two alpha i are equal. So there is no exclusion principle for bosons. Let me conclude by suggesting an exercise. So I want you to construct the anti-symmetric wave function for three identical fermions using the Slater determinant. So please write down this uh, anti-symmetric wave function for three particles for three identical fermions using the Slater determinant and convince yourself that it is consistent with the Pauli exclusion principle. With that, I shall wind up this lecture. Thank you. I hope you have followed it.